All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. Stand with me, if you will, for the reading of God's Word. I just want to encourage you because I want the anointing of God to be in this house. Amen? we got to stir the atmosphere. Look at your neighbor and say, we got to stir the atmosphere. we got to stir it up. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to stir it up. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9 this morning. I want to speak to you this morning on the title as we continue with this series called Thoughts, because as you think, so you will go. I want to talk about the thought of righteousness, the thought of righteousness. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Could it be that we are lackadaisical in the church because we've forgotten our identity? Or is there a sin, a familiarity in the body of Christ today? To when we sing a song like that, there's no emotion. Could it be that we've missed what truly Jesus has done and the price that he's paid at Calvary for you and me? See, the Bible says, those that are hungry and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. When we're hungry, we can receive. Amen? So the Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9 that if we're able to confess, then he's able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Righteousness, Father God, we just praise you and we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your presence. We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move in a mighty way in this house. Touch hearts, touch minds. Father, help us not to be where we're at, but Lord, help us to get up and move in you. And we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Look at your neighbor and say, it's the thought of righteousness. Because it's important to understand that when we look at God's word, we understand that there in the Garden of Eden, Adam was placed in a place of perfection, walking in the righteousness of God. And yet because of his disobedience, now he's hiding himself. Now he's hiding from God. And now the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It was the very moment that he disobeyed God was the moment that he looked at Eve and Eve looked at him and they thought and they thought to themselves, wait a minute, we're naked. It wasn't that they just became naked at that moment. It was that the glory was lifted. The glory used to cover them. The righteousness of God used to cover them, but it was lifted because of disobedience. But then the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came, died, and rose again and redeemed us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And now we're no longer living in unrighteousness, but as believers, we are now righteous because of what Christ Jesus has done for you and for me. We are not righteous because of works. We're not righteous because of the skin color. We're not righteous because how much money we have. We are righteous. We are in right standing with God because Jesus paid the ultimate price and died at Calvary and redeemed us out of darkness and now we are walking in the righteousness of God. We are in right standing with God. So we understand when we look at the word, we know that what the Bible says is that when we receive that salvation, that now we're walking in the righteousness of the Lord. And so many times what happens if we're not careful, if we're not careful, what happens is because everything is based upon our thoughts. And if our thoughts are still living in sin and living in unrighteousness, then it will paralyze us from operating in the spirit of faith that God has called every one of us to operate in. Because remember what we said about last week, as as our thoughts go, so we go. So how we perceive it is how we're going to receive it. So it's important that we must understand who you are and whose you are 
are in Christ Jesus. That when you wake up every day as a believer, you understand that I am in right standing with God. For there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. Go with me if you would to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17 this morning. The Bible says, all unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. There is all unrighteousness is sin, but thank God as believers, we're no longer unrighteous. We now are right standing. That's why when we sing songs, it should move us to a point because we should never forget where God has brought us from. We should never forget the muck and the mire that God has brought us up out of. We should always be reminded. We should always have passion. We should always be excited when we're talking about the blood and talking about the cross because we understand that if it had not been for the cross, if it had not been for the shedding blood, we would still be unrighteous. But we are in right standing with the God that created the universe because of what Jesus did in our life. Well, I'm telling this morning, God's got some goodness and some greatness for our life, but we must understand who we are and whose we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? I love this. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, You are God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He says in 1 John 5 and 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So now we understand that we are in right standing. So when you understand that you're in right standing with God, you don't go into his throne room with your head down, but you come boldly under the throne of grace that you may obtain favor in the time of need. That when you wake up and someone wants to bless you, you're not going to tilt your head down and say, I don't think I need to receive it. You're going to say, wait a minute. The same God that sent Jesus is the same nature that's on the inside of me as a believer and now I'm walking in royalty because I'm a king's kid because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed me whiter than snow and because of that, I am righteous with God. I don't have to work it. It's already there. I'm walking in righteousness with God. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at your neighbor and say, you're walking in righteousness 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. So you, you are not who you used to be. Let me say that again. You are not who you used to be. If you were still living the life you would have lived years ago before coming to Jesus, you may not even be alive today. But it was God's goodness and God's grace that brought you to this place. And because of that, there's a testimony on the inside of you that says, yes, I've been through this, but that's not who I am. I am who God says I am. I am who the cross says I am. I am not what my sin says. I am what my Savior says. I am not what my mistake says. I am what forgiveness says. I am not what I was yesterday, but I am a brand new being today. I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. Now all things have become new. So something stirs in my spirit that now I'm in right standing with God. Then he goes on, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So what happens is when we miss who we are in Christ, then we just go through the motions. When we miss who we are in Christ, then now we're being swayed to and fro with the emotions of the day. 
But when we are in Christ, in righteousness, it doesn't matter what may come against us, we're still going to be steadfast and not movable because we know who we are in Christ. Because, why? Because we are righteousness. Jesus paid the price so that we could be righteous. Look at your name and say, you're righteous. What happens is we want to get around everyone. We want to talk about all the sad stuff. No, we need to talk about the good stuff. We need to talk about what God has done in our life. And so go with me to Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. Isaiah 32, 17. So we know you're a brand new creature. We know now that Jesus carried the sin so that you wouldn't have to carry the sin. So now you are righteous. Look at your neighbor and say, you're righteous. In Isaiah 32, in verse 17. I've been, I've been raised in church all my life. I remember back in the day, and, and, I, and I say things like that like I did earlier because it's so true. You could get someone up here with this a guitar and sing that song, and people would shout all over the place. Maybe we've gotten too cute because we got, an instru- we got too many instruments. Think about it for a moment. Why do I keep going back on that? Because we can't do any more than what we're doing. There's got to be a response. There's got to be something that you stand up to and you begin to stir up the spirit. These people are giving everything they can give. We've got to open up and praise the Lord. It's amazing when we have new singers get up here. You know what they say? Wow, it's way different singing up here than being out there. Why? Because we feel the umph. How do we break the umph? By just standing, by just clapping, by just praising. We can break through something in this house. There's been a spirit over this place for years that you get excited about the new stuff, but after two or three times, you you get tired of it. And that's been here for years. We're going to break it in the name of Jesus. And I'm speaking prophetically right here. I'm getting off my sermon right here. I'm speaking prophetically. And I know we got some people that are new in the house, but that's okay. This has to be said this morning. Because I'm telling you, when someone would give it all they can on a saxophone and we just sat down, God, that upsets me. Show them that we, re- that, that, we, that we support them. Then we wonder why young people don't want to be in the church. Isaiah chapter 32, I'm going to get off it. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 70. If you, if you agree with me, praise the Lord for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Back, back, I just can't get off it. Back in the day, when they would do that, they would have what they call a Jericho march. People would start walking around the building, so the Holy Ghost would fall. But God can't move something that's still. But man, if we can move something... It don't take much just. And when our winning team wins, someone gives you a million dollars. Amen. All right, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. I'm trying to keep quiet. I'm trying to be nice. Help me, Jesus. Isaiah 32 and verse 17. The work of righteousness, because remember, we're talking about right standing, right? So the work of righteousness shall be what or will be what? Peace. So the work of, when we understand who we are in Christ Jesus, there will be peace. Jesus said, the peace that I give unto you surpasses all understanding. The problem we don't have peace is because we don't understand who we are and whose we are in Christ. When you truly understand that you're righteous, you'll have no desire to sin. When you truly understand that you're righteous, you'll be very careful what enters your ears. When you truly understand you're righteous, you'll be very careful what you put your eyes to. Come on now, somebody. When you truly understand your righteousness, you will not hang out with people that you don't need to hang out with. 
when you truly understand the spirit of righteousness, you won't come to him with any excuse to say, Lord, no, I have to live a holy life, not because I have to, but because I want to, because I'm in right standing with God, and the goodness of God is on my life, and the things Paul said I used to love, I now hate, and the things I once hated, I now love, because Paul said I'm not the same man anymore. I used to be the one that would lock up Christians and put them to death, but on my way to Damascus, I was thrown off of my horse, and this Saul became Paul, and I had an experience and an encounter with Jesus, and it radically changed my life. And he went about preaching the good news of the gospel and wrote practically all of the New Testament. Why? Because he understood who he was in Jesus. He didn't walk around condemned, but he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt in whom he believed the one that made him righteous. So there was a peace that was on his life. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a peace that's on his life. The work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, so there's an effect of righteousness, will be quietness. Psalms 46 and 10, be still and know that I am God. So what happens is, is righteousness not only brings peace, but righteousness brings quietness. Quietness in your spirit. Quietness in your mind. Quietness to where you can sleep. Quietness. So no matter what's going on around you, you're not moved by what you see because you're sticking and staying in righteousness. Because an effect of knowing who I am in Christ is that quietness will always be there. I don't have to work for it. It's there in Jesus' name. And then the effect of righteousness, quietness, and what? Assurance forever. Not insurance, but assurance. Amen. What is assurance? What's another word for assurance? Confidence. 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 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 14. Now this is the confidence, this is the assurance that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we have this confidence knowing that as we're asking, he's already heard. And as he's heard, he's already going to deliver. That's why Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God. And then he said in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, what sort of things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I'm not believing when manifestation of my promise shows up. I'm believing in the moment I prayed it because the moment it comes out of my mouth, I've already made up in my heart and I've already believed what his promise has said because I'm in right standing with God and I know that he's not going to hold anything back that belongs to his children. As long as I'm praying the will of the Father, it is good pleasure to bless his people. Can I tell you this morning, God wants to give you confidence and assurance that God will bring it to pass in the name of Jesus, but you have to have the mindset of righteousness. Because righteousness brings about the quietness and righteousness brings about the assurance. Look at your name and say, be assured. And then the Bible tells us in Proverbs 28 and 1. Go with me to Proverbs 28 and 1. Proverbs 28 and 1. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, this is good this morning. Proverbs 28 and verse number 1. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Come on, somebody. When you don't understand that you're righteous, you're going to run and flee over anything. But the righteous are bold. I think in the world we live in today, we don't have much boldness. We're so careful what we say because we don't want to offend anyone. We're so careful in the words we say and the, word, the things we do. 
because we're afraid it may upset someone else's apple cart. But the world has no concern for your apple cart. And the righteous are as bold as... The righteous are not timid. The righteous are not cowering. The righteous are not backing up. The righteous are as bold as lions. May I remind you, you're from the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The Bible said the, the, the devil is like a roaring lion. How many know if there's a difference between like and is? He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but there's a real lion, and that's you. The righteousness are as bold as a lion. So when we submit ourselves unto God, we can resist the devil, and the devil will flee because we understand who we are and whose we are in Christ Jesus. So the righteousness are as bold as a lion. We're not timid. We're not backing down. We're going forward in Jesus. Amen? So the righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no one pursues. They're always up and down, up and down. And go with me to Exodus chapter 4, and I need you to see this. Exodus chapter 4. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to know you're righteous. Know your identity. Amen? Know your identity. Exodus chapter number 4 and verse 10. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? I'm, still, I'm sorry, I'm reading here Exodus chapter 4. I'm Exodus chapter 3, 313. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he says, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God says, listen, who do you want me to tell them? Just tell them I am sent you. But notice this. In Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. God speaks to him in Exodus 3, go to, the, go to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. Who, who says, I am tell, tell him sent you. Then he says, verse four or chapter 4, wait a minute, I can't speak for you. I've got stuttering lips, stuttering tongue. I'm shy, I can't speak. Finally, he says, listen, God's wanting to send Moses. Moses says, wait a minute, I can't do it. Send someone else. God raises up Aaron. See, God didn't want to use Aaron. God wanted to use Moses. But Moses failed to understand his identity in Christ. Because he already had told him that, listen, I'm going to tell you what to speak. And then he begins to give the excuse, well, I can't speak clearly. And then God says, where were you when I created the heavens? Where were you when I've done all of this? Can I not touch your mouth? Can I do something great? And yet the Bible says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Why? Because God was upset that Moses did not understand his identity. Can a pastor get upset at people when they don't respond to praise and worship? God got upset with Moses. Hey, I'm just the mailman this morning. Do you see that? Why did God's heart get kindled against Moses? This is what you were supposed to do, but you don't understand your identity. You would rather let, this is the American church, you would rather let someone else do it while you watch them. I can't get there earlier. I can't volunteer. Or I can't do this or I can't do that. All the excuses, but no, no, I've chosen you to be my mouthpiece. But you refuse to get off your hiney or your blessed assurance. 
I know I'm just grinding at someone. If you've been offended earlier, I know it's just grinding at you, and praise God it is. Because I want breakthrough. Give me breakthrough. Give me no. I want breakthrough. He says, he, he gets mad. He, listen to this. His anger is kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. God's like, I don't want Aaron. I chose you. Now, look what happens. Go to Exodus 32. Remember, Moses doesn't want to speak. Moses is like, ah, I've got the stuttering tongue. I can't speak plainly. But notice in Exodus 32, this is the same guy we're talking about. 32, verse number 9, Exodus 32, 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and indeed is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. My God. God's upset at the people because he said they're nothing but stiff-necked. See, when you're stiff-necked, you can't move. He says, I'm going to wipe them out and give you a new group of people to lead, Moses. Think about that for a moment. He says, listen, I'm going to get rid of all this, all that stiff neck. I'm getting rid of it. I'm going to burn it hot, and I'm going to develop other people for you to lead in because they're not going to be able to take you in. Notice Moses. What does Moses do? Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. What are you saying, pastor? This is the same guy that in chapter four told God he cannot be a spokesperson because he cannot speak. What happened? He got shifted into his identity. He realized who he was in God and the calling that God had on his life. So now he's not speaking to people. He's speaking to the very God that had given him an assignment and said, wait a minute, whatever you do, don't take it out on the people. May I remind you that you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you see the shift from a man back in Exodus chapter four that couldn't speak and said, Lord, send someone else. But now he's the one that's interceding on behalf of the people. He's the one that stepped in before they were wiped out. Moses stepped in and said, oh God, may I remind you of your covenant. May I remind you of your promises. May I remind you that you said that you would bless us as the stars of heaven. May I remind you that the lamb belongs to your children. May I remind you that we're still covenant people. And it was at that moment that the Bible says in verse 14 that the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Why? Because Moses began to walk in his identity and because Moses was willing to walk in his identity, a nation was saved at that very moment. Can I tell you, it's time to put those excuses aside and say, God, whatever you have me to do, I'm going to walk in my righteousness, stand in my righteousness, think in my righteousness, and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it shall be done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, Rebecca. No, Cassie. Cassie, would you please come this morning? There she is. Hallelujah. Stand with me all over the house this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm going to leave you with this this morning. Got to know who you are in Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, know who you are in Christ. The fact is this, if you don't know that you're righteous, 
the devil's going to beat you up. First John chapter five and verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Remember, when you know you're righteous, you don't sin. And then you keep yourself, and the wicked one does not touch or harm him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. He ends 1 John chapter 5 and says, so be it. He says, listen, he says, whoever is born of God does not sin. Whoever understands that they are righteous because of what Jesus has done. Remember, it's a thought. It's what you perceive. We receive it by faith and begin to walk that we are now righteous because of what Jesus has done. Isaiah says, because of that, we have quietness and we have assurance. Because of what Christ has done, we understand that we are not going to be moved by the evil one or the wicked one. The wicked one will not harm us. We know that we're of God. Then he says, keep yourself from idols. What is an idol? Anything you put before God. Anything that you give more attention to than God is an idol. I know when we talk about idols, we're thinking about statues or, 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 or monuments. But I'm telling you this morning that an idol is anything that you put before God. For some of us, it's fear. Because we're dwelling more on fear than we are the God that we serve. It's wherever you go, whenever your thoughts are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing this morning. But I do know this, that God is looking for men and women that are red hot for him in this day and hour. If you don't know who you are in Christ, the enemy on a daily basis will beat you up. And you just got to take authority and say, in the name of Jesus, I am who I am because of the Christ that's in me. And I'm protected by the blood of Jesus. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Father God, we just praise you and we thank you this morning. Father, we come to you and we give you praise and glory forever and ever and ever. God, you know every need that's in this house. You know every situation. Lord, I truly believe that breakthrough is coming to this house. But God, your people have to be hungry. Stir up this house. Stir up our hearts and our lives for you. God, that we'll just not go through just being normal. But God, that we'll be radical. Radical sons and daughters of the Most High God. Understanding who we are in you. God, when we understand that we've been made righteous, the devil can't touch us. So, Father, whatever needs are in this house and those that's watching online, that you would touch every situation, touch every person, oh God. Father, I know you're wanting to do great and extraordinary things. And, Lord, I'm just asking this morning that every chain would be broken, whatever's holding people back. God, we come against the Spirit. Father, we just break it in the name of Jesus. We declare no more. And God, we give you praise and we give you glory. God, those that are weak, we thank you for strength. Those that need their healing to be manifested, we thank you, God, that it's being manifested right now. That ears are being opened and blinded eyes are being opened, God, that they may see the truth of your word. God, that you said in your word that we are bold as lions. We're not backing down. 
God, may there be a boldness in this house. May there, may there be a roar in this house. Father, we give you praise and we give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name we pray. And everyone said, come on, can you give them another hand clap of praise this morning? Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to give into this ministry, we have three ways to give. You can either give in person on Sunday or Monday through Thursday from 9 until 3. You can always go to our website at encountercog.com forward slash give. Or you can mail your contribution directly to 12240 Five Mile Road, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22407. Once again, thank you for joining us.